Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. The U-2 spy plane, also known as the Dragon Lady, is a single-jet engine, high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft developed by Lockheed Martin for the U.S. Air Force. The aircraft was used during Operation Desert Storm as one of the most secret U.S. weapon systems. The U-2 spy plane is capable of gathering surveillance and sending intelligence data back to the control room in real time. It can loiter at 70,000 feet over the area of operations. It can do this for several hours. It's often described as a glider due to its flight characteristics. A U-2 excels at high altitude reconnaissance missions. Taking off and landing is very challenging. It has a 105 foot wingspan and only two landing gear under the nose and the tail. The landing of the U-2 spy plane is kind of a controlled crash. The pilot descends and slows until the plane stalls, dropping onto the runway. All of this process is guided by fellow pilots racing behind in a chase car. After taking off, the U-2 frequently flies at about 70,000 feet. Which offers a unique view of the curvature of the Earth. But this altitude is above Armstrong's line, where water boils at body temperature, and life is not sustainable. The pilots are required to wear a spacesuit, which weighs about 70 pounds, similar to what astronauts use on space missions. Without the suit and a pressurized cockpit, the water in the aviator's body would escape as a gas, thereby causing tissue damage and blocking blood flow. Before flying an actual U-2, the pilots must adapt to the physical strain of operating it. The suit can be a physical and psychological stumbling block. Once the pilots are suited up, they are moved to a big reclining chair and hooked up to oxygen and cooling air. As the inflated suit is pretty tight, walking up the ladder into the aircraft and getting seated is a tough process. The U-2 pilots cannot strap themselves into the cockpit and need a technician's help to set things up.
the pilots fly at this maximum altitude for around 10 to 12 hours. And due to the task at hand, they don't feel much discomfort because of the suit. However, after landing, some pilots reported feeling the strain acutely. The purpose behind the Sioux is to protect them from the negative effects of high altitudes. It's like every single part of the Sioux is specifically made to protect them from for when they go up in altitude. As we fly higher and closer to space, the biggest hurdle is maintaining the atmosphere within the aircraft or the space shuttle. Unlike the crushing pressure deep in the ocean, the high altitude provides very little pressure. As altitude increases, the available oxygen, air density, and temperature decreases. When jet aircraft were developed, the pilots needed pressurized flight suits to cope with the low atmospheric pressure and lack of oxygen at high altitudes. A pressure suit provides adequate oxygen to the pilot, makes communication easier, accommodates the intake of food and fluids, and gives mobility to the pilot to complete the mission. Most of these suits were designed to be used only when the pressurized cabin failed. It's made with inflatable neoprene rubber coated fabric, along with a more rigid fabric over the neoprene to restrain the suit and direct the pressure inward on the pilot. The history of the pressure suit in the last almost 100 years is marvelous. The early photos of pilots in their pressurized suits are laughable. However, that was the state of the art for the time. The early advancement of pressure suits required in the Project Excelsior and for the pilots to fly the SR-71 and U-2 directly led to the development of the spacesuits of today's NASA astronauts. The astronauts practice in NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory to train for spacewalks outside the International Space Station. The facility requires the largest indoor swimming pool in the world, holding over 23 million liters of water. Training underwater is the same as experiencing weightlessness on Earth. So the astronauts put on a complete space suit and wander around in depths for hours, carrying out repairs and other tasks on the fake space station to prepare for the real thing, 260 miles above Earth. The entire process of putting on the spacesuit requires around 45 minutes. I'm good, Rod. Ditto. Ready? One, two, three. Later. A bulky yellow crane carries the platform holding the astronauts and lowers it slowly until the astronaut is completely submerged underwater. Good. 
Due to the spacesuit and some additional weight of the equipment, the astronauts remain neutrally buoyant. The oxygen is provided to the astronauts by the pipes attached to their suits via umbilical-like cords that hang over the pool. Support and training divers move the astronauts underwater and guide them toward their starting point, the airlock of the replica station. Divers face several challenges, such as maintaining body temperature, the ability to breathe, and controlling buoyancy. To maintain the proper body temperature underwater, the divers must wear an insulating suit. During the early days, divers had to rely on a manually operated pump at the surface to provide them with air. A hose connected to the helmet supplied air to the diver. When pressurized steam lines aboard a submarine rupture, they may leak steam at extremely high temperatures, potentially resulting in severe injury or death. The sailors must wear protective suits to rescue crewmates and make emergency repairs. Sailors from the Los Angeles-class attack submarine Toledo recently tested the newest suit designed to protect sailors from steam leaks on nuclear-powered submarines. The sailors wore thick gloves, boots, and a face shield for a self-contained breathing apparatus. The air tank and hose for the breathing apparatus are worn on the outside instead of under a chemical suit, allowing better access to oxygen. Moreover, the new prototype suit features a unique style of gloves. While the older steam suit has mittens, the new prototype features lobster claws with thumbs and two fingers, which makes it easier for the sailors to grab tools, climb ladders, and navigate the close confines of a submarine. Special suits are also used during submarine rescues. In 2014, a NATO fleet of ships, submarines, and aircraft converged on the Polish port of Gdynia. It was the largest submarine rescue exercise of its type in the world. Several NATO and non-NATO countries attend this triannual deployment due to its broad international interest. The object of this exercise is to train international crews in maritime rescue. The operations are carried out on the seabed with the help of state-of-the-art technology, which is extremely important for the safe evacuation of submarine personnel. The divers reach out to the desired location in a life raft. The sailors within the submarine follow the emergency evacuation procedures and wear orange survival suits to reach the surface. Finally, the divers carry the sailors in the life raft back to the ship. Protective suits are required for pilots, sailors and divers due to the extreme pressure and temperature conditions at both high altitudes and underwater. Due to this reason, the United States is constantly spending millions of dollars to improve these suits and provide mobility to the person using them. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.